What's going on everyone? My name is Nicholas Merton here at Datadash and today is November 26th of 2019. Well folks, I hope you are having a fantastic day wherever you are. And in today's update, we've got to ask ourselves a very key question and that is, what has led to the majority of this correction? I know a lot of people have had that on their minds and have been curious as to why out of a lot of the midway corrections that we've had in the previous two cycles, this has been the worst one yet being down over more than 50%. So we'll talk a little bit about what I mean by that and what might have caused this. So we've got a lot of things we want to pinpoint to to explain this. But outside of that as well, we've got a sponsored interview with Bybit towards the end of the video. So stay tuned for that, guys. You won't want to miss it. Anyways, let's go ahead here and take a look across the board on the market. We can see here crypto markets are generally to the upside at the moment. Again, not too serious in the sense of the movement, but we're still seeing the majority of players here up above 1% to 2% to the upside. Global market cap here, if we take a look, again, not shifting too much, still hovering around 195 at the moment, hovering near that $200 billion even. Again, so long as it holds this range, guys, this is gold, and this is exactly what we want to see. If it diverts a little bit further from that, I would say the next target range would be to test down here around $180 billion, where we had resistance multiple times around $185 billion. In the sense of altcoins in this case, seeing how altcoins are playing a role in this, again, not too far down from their previous highs, only about three billion. So what I'm gonna be looking out for is a scenario where not only alts can possibly keep up with Bitcoin as we start to rally back higher towards 10K to 12K, but along with that as well, I'd hope to see that altcoins can actually in some cases outpace Bitcoin, right? Maybe not to any severe degree, maybe we'll see it in some key players, who knows? But I think there's a lot of good setups uh, between some of the plays we have as well as some other cryptos that could lead to that event. Now I wanna share with you all real quick before we dive into our key question for the day. Uh, about what you know, why Bitcoin's correction has been so stark. I want to share a little bit of update um, on uh, the indicator that we're building, right? So this is the SMS in this case. We haven't published it yet. Uh, again, at least the at least the final version in this case that you guys will be able to use. But I just wanted to share with you guys and you know show you what it looks like and how it works. So it's a five point uh, strategy in this case. It's, ba it's basically taking in three of our favorite indicators: the squeeze momentum indicator, the MACD, and the stochastic RSI. And you can see here that when we cross over this three point line here, right? So it's a five point indicator. Once we get a majority of uh, points here, three out of five or more, right? You can see here that we get a green cross, it turns into green here. And then the preceding week, right, once we've got a close on that weekly candle, in this case, it enters in a long position. And vice versa, right, once we, once we have a, a cross here into the red, we go below three points down to two points or lower. And in this case, the next preceding week, we close our entries on a long position, right? So I wanna be clear with you guys, it is not perfect yet. We are still working on some of the kinks on it to make sure performance works well. And we don't want it to just work well for Bitcoin, we want it to work well across most assets, right? And we want it to predominantly work on these longer term time frames because in my belief, that's really where the profitability comes in because you don't have a lot of over trading, uh, not to mention you're not over stressing about what your positions are. It's just trading on the broader trends here. And the nice thing about it and the key objective of it is to be where you can be like, look, the trend is fading out here in Bitcoin. I'm going to close my position. I'm going to wait for not only for probably a correction, but I'm going to wait for the trend to start again, right? I'm going to wait for those indicators to flash. And so far, we're still getting a zero reading here. Right. And this doesn't mean, again, that this is the end all for Bitcoin, as we've been talking about on the channel. Uh, you know, again, I've been talking about, again, getting a little bit more eager as prices come down here. For example, the absolute bottom was at zero here, right? But again, uh, we're just going to wait for the trend reversal in this case to be confident. Uh, it, sorry, what we're going to do is we're going to wait for the indicator to flash, uh, you know, at least three points or higher in order to say that the trend is likely going to start soon, right? So. Anyways, just wanted to share that with you guys. I think it's a pretty cool little index uh, strategy com combination, and we'll have it out soon. It's not ready yet, but I'll let you guys know as soon as it comes out so you guys can test it out. All right, so let's actually go ahead, turn off the drawings here, turn off the strategy. Let's go ahead and talk a little bit about why this correction has been more stark than others, right? So again, we've had these previous corrections in the past. In fact, I'll actually bring it over to the BLX indicator just to kind of get some more perspective with the even further cycle, uh, some of the other cycles in Bitcoin. So we can see here that if we take a look into not only the correction here, as well as some of the corrections that we've had for Bitcoin as it exited out of the accumulation phase, this has been the most stark correction that we've had. It's been a little over 50%. And that's more than the previous, you know, 30 to 40% corrections that we're used to. 
So what does this mean for Bitcoin in this case? You know, why is it that this happened? I think that's the first question. And also, is this something to be concerned about going forward in the cycle? Okay. So let's go ahead and talk about this first question. Well, luckily, Cointelegraph has actually brought about an article where they asked the Vanek executive for possible reasons for this. And being the creator of hopefully what may be one of the Bitcoin ETFs, I think he's got a pretty good, decent perspective, seeing as he spends a lot of time in the markets talking about these things. And it just gives a good precursor on some topics here we can dive through, a good little structure to kind of dive through. Well, the first one here is China's publicity war on cryptocurrency. So with what seemed like extremely positive news, which is China's positive tone on blockchain technology, it actually comes as quite negative news uh, in the sense of cryptocurrencies, because they did not mention anything in regards to the support of cryptocurrencies. And there is a big difference in the eyes of China and I think the general public who knows about crypto between bl just simply blockchain technology for corporate use case versus cryptocurrencies, censorship resistant digital assets. Um, there's not much of a place for it in China. And in fact, they've actually had a, a pretty, you know, decent, I, I would say, crackdown in this case over the last few years. The issue is, is that people have been overhyping this crackdown, right? So as much as the news is not so much positive for crypto in the sense that China's pro-blockchain, the bad news that's come out of it in the sense of the crackdowns and the supposed shutdowns of exchanges it's not much. It's really not much. It's more of a waning fear that's been remaining in markets, right? I will say this has been the, the core reason, no doubt, but I think it's been uh, fears that have been oversold in the market, right? People have overbought into this idea of China cracking down on cryptocurrencies. They haven't been able to do it for the last two to three years, and I don't think they're going to be able to, right? I mean, they've been allowing mining rigs to willfully run, They've uh, not been able to shut down OTC desks very well because, you know, OTC desks are very difficult to be able to shut down there. They can be set up overnight somewhere else, and there's all kinds of different ways to communicate and exchange. So I, I don't really see it, right? Now, the other thing as well is tax reporting arbitrage. Uh, in this case, this is basically where people are purposely driving down the market in order to have less of an obligation towards tax season. I don't know if that's actually the case because it's going to take a lot of Bitcoin to do that. Um, but who knows? Might be. It's your call on that, guys. Uh, I, I don't, you can only really do it for one year and then your profits you make next year, right? You're, you're going to have to eventually pay tax. I, I just, I don't think that's, uh, I mean, maybe it could be the case, but I don't think the whales in China are really worrying about that. <laughs> um, the other one as well is Bitcoin liquidity. Now, I think this is probably another one that I'm a little bit concerned about because, again, we're in a period of time where we're seeing, again, miners who are continuously selling off. And it doesn't seem like right now we're seeing that kind of crazy buy side pressure we had back in the earlier months of 2019. Liquidity is evaporating quite fast. And they referenced here to something from SKU Markets, which showcased the spread of a $10 million buy order here across most exchanges and the kind of spread you're gonna pay in price for that $10 million order. Now, of course, most people go to OCC, but it doesn't really matter. Like this is just a general gauge here of what the spread was gonna be, right? If you were to do something like that. And if the spread is growing, this generally means that there's less liquidity on the order book, right? There's less bid and ask orders, which means there's less overall volume in the market. There's less actual cash available to make trades and also less Bitcoin being sold, right? So we can see here that the spread has grown quite large. Now you can see here why people are trading on exchanges like BitMEX, right? Why they're trading on exchanges like FTX and also um, on, you know, Darabin, I guess Binance is still holding up there compared to most spot exchanges. But the issue here is that most people are trading on these margin platforms because A, the liquidity is there. Uh, for, well, that's really actually the reason the liquidity is there for their trades. Whereas on a lot of these exchanges, on spot exchanges, there's not enough spot volume and people aren't trading on spots, so we can't get really good price discovery. We get these massive moves in the market where big whales are making big bets on BitMEX and they're manipulating the underlying spot market, right? 
So that's a really big issue here, guys, that we have to keep in mind here. I would say the biggest issue here, and on a surface level, it plays into the fears in relation to China, why we're not getting much buyers in the market, and that's why we've had such a stark correction. I don't think, I don't think it's minor capitulation. It's really a lack of liquidity and fears of China that have led to this correction, where we've gone down uh, more in total from the highs down to 50% or more, right? That explains it. That explains a good reason for this, guys. And again, I don't think this is something to fear here, right? That's the second question, you know, is this okay? It is okay because we're still well beyond two times from the bottom here. And at the same time in the last cycle, we weren't even there, right? We hadn't even done that. Not to mention we had an accumulation phase that lasted more than a year. Our accumulation phase lasted a matter of a little over a quarter, a little over three to four months. I still can't believe those who actually think we're in a bearish. I mean, sure, yes, we're in a correction. Fair point, guys. Doesn't look very beautiful on the chart. It looks looks quite disturbing in this case. But it only looks disturbing if you're considering the fact, you know, that we, uh, if, if you don't consider the fact that we had an extremely short accumulation phase and rallied faster than any exit out of any accumulation in Bitcoin in history over the last two cycles. I mean, we had a massive rally. It was over 350, 60%. I mean, we can get, actually get the actual number here. I'll go ahead and draw it on the chart just to put some perspective here, guys. Let's see. Of course, it'd be green, but oh, sorry. Sorry, about 330%, right? If you look at any of the exits out of the accumulation phase, right? Nothing close to that. Even at taking up here, right? <laughs> it's still not enough. It's 260 to 270%. So... Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse here. You can see here, guys, that with the parabolic lines of support for the long term, we're getting very close to the bottom here. It really depends on your mindset on this, guys. You're going to have to choose. And again, we've got a lot of people like Plan B, people who are doing the data science here, doing the focus on the long term trends, keeping in mind a lot of the data science models for Bitcoin. They're keeping confident and they're keeping in line with their projections. So. That's going to be it for today's daily update, guys. I hope you all enjoyed this video. If you liked it, please drop a like, guys. It's always appreciated. And if you got something to say, whether it be positive or negative, if you agree or disagree, leave a comment down below. We'd love to hear from you guys. That all being realized, let's go ahead and sit down with Ben Zhao, who is the founder of Bybin. All right, everyone. So today we are here in Singapore on the opposite end of the world from where I'm usually at on the east coast of the U.S. I'm sitting down with Ben Zhao, who is the founder of Bybit, a leading margin trading platform that's up and coming to compete with some of the bigger players in the space. Ben, we talked last in Hong Kong. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me in the office. It's nice to do one of these in person. You know, usually everything's online nowadays in the crypto space. Yeah, no, thank you for having me on the show. I'm very glad you can come visit us to see um, how the operation goes and all that. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's nice, you know, it's kind of awesome to actually be able to walk into the offices of these projects and companies. And, you know, I, I definitely have a lot of interesting questions to talk to you about, because, you know, being in the US, I guess it's kind of a, a foreign world for most of us in regards to margin trading, but I've traded in traditional markets. You had mentioned to me when we were talking about having an experience in Forex markets as well, I've traded in Forex. So I understand the importance of being able to increase your risk appetite, but also doing proper risk management. Yeah. So I want to go ahead and just dive right into it. You know, there's been a lot of people in the cryptocurrency space who I think show an interest for margin trading. But for the last few years, we've kind of been stuck with BitMEX and a few other plays yeah. in the crypto space. And obviously, I think, as you know, being, being one of the competitors, I guess, to them, there's a lot of issues when it comes to using platforms like BitMEX, uh, especially for this market demand for margin trading, which has been growing. So definitely take some time to talk a little bit about what you guys are going to buy. But I'd, I'd like to hear about some of the things, what you're doing. Yeah. So yeah. Um, as you mentioned, my background, I guess um, I should first mention that mm -hmm. um, I was uh, running a retail forex exchange for uh, mm -hmm. a little bit more than seven years, close to eight years. And um, so I got sort of into crypto back in uh, 2007, very early 2017, actually by a friend. He's actually from eToro. So oh, he nice. called, we were having whiskey and he told me, check out this whole Bitcoin and things. And so I um, checked it out. And actually, I've watched a lot of your videos. Thank so you, I'm, I appreciate I'm a it. fan, yeah. <laughs> it's a very honor to be on the show. So um, yeah, um, I'm very used to Forex. And because it's a very mature and very well-structured market, mm -hmm. uh, clients are uh, getting basically the best execution, the overall best uh, trading experience. Mm -hmm. And when I moved into crypto, after I sort of got hooked by this uh, blockchain tag and uh, and the possibility of mass adoption of uh, crypto technology. Mm -hmm. um, 
I um, looked into uh, all the margin uh, exchange or the derivative exchange at, at the time, uh, which is only Bitmax and OKEX at the time, who offered uh, this type of product. And um, I, I realized there are a lot of inefficiencies and a lot of improvement can be done, uh, at least from my knowledge. So uh, that's why I decided to fund Bybit. And so we funded the project um, last year, uh, 2018 in March. Mm -hmm. So And then it took us about uh, eight months to write the code, complete our in-house, and uh, to launch the platform last year, December. Mm -hmm. So we've been running for a little bit less than a year. And um, thanks to our partners and the trust of the clients, we've been growing very tremendously. Yeah, I guess yeah. Been, you guys have really grown, and I think it speaks to something. Uh, the issue that I've seen over the last year or two is margin trading has gotten more popular. On, on most major margin trading platforms, you have matching engines that don't work to the right. degree that they need to. They can't process the transactions per second, or they're just not going through. Along with that as well, there's things like internal trading desks. There's a lot of concerns that people have. So you guys coming in, I think at this time, providing a really good product so far. I, I know most people I follow who are much more active traders than myself, uh, who are active in margin trading, actually seem to really enjoy the platform. You guys are real-time customer support, big thing for me personally. Yeah. <laughs> I, think. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Sometimes it's, it's just so difficult. You would think uh, in most industries, you'd be able to reach someone, especially one where you know, you're allocating a ton of money and trading 24-7 yeah. and stuff. Yeah. But, so I think that's a good thing that you guys meet too. Uh, right. And I think that you've just got an overall good philosophy in fixing those core issues that were prevalent for so long. Yeah, I mean, uh, a lot of people ask, what does Bybit bring new to the table? Mm -hmm. I mean, um, my whole philosophy of funding the Bybit, it wasn't to bring anything extremely new, mm -hmm. but to really bring what is already being existing and the traders are not getting in crypto. So you talk about uh, volatility and the major issue uh, I found uh, when we found a buy bit was uh, during volatility, no exchange work. I mean, mm -hmm. there was overload issues, there were server downtimes. So I, I think what we are focusing is the fundamental. So what does really trader need from exchange? Mm -hmm. It's simply to execute orders on top of keeping the security, the fund secure and all that. But the number one requirement is make sure you can execute orders, especially during volatility. Mm -hmm. So about two weeks ago, I think we saw a huge 40% pump of uh, Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, there were a lot of issues with exchanges. And uh, we were knocking on wood. Luckily, Bybit was, was sort of standing, uh, doing everything correctly. And uh, that sort of gave us a, a lot of good reputation during that time. And we saw a huge influx of new traders coming or switching to Bybit because of uh, during that pump, we sort of prove ourselves, our matching and our um, uh, the, the hard work we put in from the IT team are proven to be very uh, su successful. Yeah, yeah, I mean, honestly, as you're talking about, I guess on the kind of counter yeah. side, there's a lot of other players in the exchange space during that same time period when Bitcoin was rallying in a very short 24 hour window. Yeah. Even afterwards, some huge issues on the order books, right. on uh, orders executing that shouldn't have. So I think, I think people try to overcomplicate, you know, some exchanges are really trying to go out of their way to be able to do a dozen different things at once. Uh, but it's really a matter of just executing orders and providing the base products that people really want and yeah. taking it one step at a time. But I think that's why you, so you guys have grown to about 30,000 users now, if I'm correct, 30,000 uh, active. Uh, 30,000 active traders. Mm -hmm. So uh, on that day when we're, we had the huge pump, we actually had about 30 something thousand people, uh, client traded uh, within that 24 wow. hours. Yeah. But um, we have uh, around over 150 registered and uh, mostly come from all over the globe. So mm. we have clients from Europe, from Korea, from Japan, from China. Uh, so we are a truly global platform that serves uh, all over the world. Yeah. Mm. yeah. And one thing I wanted to talk about, because I know we're here in Singapore and everything, and we'll be on one of the panels later for Blog yeah. Show. Uh, I'm, I'm really interested, uh, you know, we talked a little bit before, but why is it that you guys chose Singapore in this case as a place to headquarter? You know, we've been seeing all these different kind of hubs for blockchain companies and crypto companies as well. As a, you know, exchange platform in this case, why did you choose Singapore? Um, number one is Singapore is becoming the crypto hub for, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, just overall projects and exchange. There are a lot of events happening. So we had a Singapore consensus week, uh, I think about two months ago. And then uh, right now is the block show and also the core market cap. Their first event, they picked Singapore. So uh, it's becoming the hub. And it used to be Hong Kong, I think. Now yeah. uh, it's moving, uh, shifting towards Singapore. One of the biggest reasons is because the local government is very supporting of Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think the MAS just released some statement. They are, they are offering four different licenses wow. from fiat to, to coin, uh, which uh, we actually have our lawyer to see what we can uh, talk to them about. And um, hopefully, uh, the overall opinion we get from legal, from our lawyers, is just 
Singapore is very open for that, and they seem to be want to be one of the countries taking a lead on that. So uh, when we decided, okay, if we want to put our op operations, uh, we want to be in a place that welcoming uh, crypto. So yeah. it seems to be the best spot, and then everyone come all over the world come here to. Uh, have their project exchange set up so uh, this is a hub yeah absolutely i yeah. think it's it's perfectly stated in the sense that it's a hub because you've got everything kind of the, the perfect kind of cocktail to serve as a hub for blockchain you've got the regulatory environment which is definitely outpacing hong kong and even some areas like malta and yeah. estonia yeah uh, but along with that as well you've got all of the talent when it comes to finance and developers out in this region with all the all the banks and traditional financial players that yeah. are in this area yeah. i mean you guys are right in the middle of the financial district yeah and also even just for a company standpoint view you you we are, since we have global operation, we want to hire talent people who can speak multiple languages. Mm -hmm. So in the office here, we have Russian speakers, we have Japanese speakers, we have Korean, um, Vietnamese, Thai speakers. I mean, it seems like Singapore just place can bring all these people, all these yeah. talents, so we can hire them. And uh, relatively more expensive than other places, but uh, definitely the talent pool is different higher. So uh, this is what we find. And, um, we're glad we picked Singapore as our hub. Yeah, that's the thing. You, you pay a little bit more, you get higher quality and yep. stuff. And I think that's what's yep. needed in this space, you know, to actually grow. So, again, I'm, I gotta say, it's exciting to actually see the exchange growing. And as I mentioned, for someone like myself who's not really an active, well, in the United States, I can't technically margin trade no. in this case, yep. but I, I'm curious, you know, where are you guys seeing your growth globally right now? And, you know, also as well, where are you guys looking to expand uh, over, over the longer term? Right, you've obviously been able to execute trades, you've got a good matching system. You've kind of hit the core issues that yeah. were prevalent in the space. Yeah. You know, where do you guys want to tackle next for some of your next goals? So that's more of we are focusing on localization from this point on. Mm -hmm. So in a very, for the first, uh, from December to now, we were focusing on our product, making sure that the core, the fundamentals are there. And we've been getting our clients mostly from uh, Europe, uh, English speaking spaces. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, we got some good clients from Japan and Korea, but uh, we've never been able to attack China because mm -hmm. for Chinese users, uh, they are so focusing on mobile trading. Right. And uh, so we want to make sure we design, we make a very good mobile app dedicated for perpetual contract. Uh, that's very easy to use. So we designed that about six months ago, and we're finally about to launch our app. So the official launch is coming up very soon. So. Uh, and, and the next uh, market on our horizon is Russia, uh, Vietnam, Thailand. And with these markets, we need to focus a lot on localization, right. uh, dedicated uh, language support for the locals, uh, dedicated marketing staff to market our product. So for example, uh, for Korea, we spend a lot of time. So we have a full team of uh, Korean support. Uh, we have a good uh, 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 Kakao talk uh, and also neighbor blog and all these oh, localization yeah. things you need to do. So at this point, when we say we target the market, you need to ask what the clients are and what they need. And if they want to see you in neighbor, then you got to be in neighbor. Uh, for Japanese, we got to make an official line account right. so that we can publish all of our uh, materials and everything to the users. So it's, it's really up to the exchange now to get to the users. Whereas I think in comparison 2016, 2017, exchange were waiting for the exchange to come up, the users to come aboard. So I think that has been the mentality change among exchange. We yeah, to so get to the users. So localizing the experience more yeah. for those individual yeah. regions yeah. you want to tap yeah. into. I completely agree. It's, it's simple yeah. stuff like that yeah. where usually <laughs> maybe a team only has a Telegram group chat, but you know mm -hmm. they won't actually you know be using Telegram in Korea where Kakao is basically. The main so we use Kakao, and then yeah. for China we use WeChat, yeah, WeChat. WeChat groups, and so Line it's all these yeah, it's all these complications. Yeah. yeah. No, but it's interesting. I think it's an interesting story, Ben, and I'm, I'm amazed to see how fast you guys have grown. It obviously speaks if, if people are moving over at this rate. Obviously, you guys are providing, I think, a better service than most of the exchanges. I've had a personal belief, as I kind of hinted to earlier, that there has been a needed change. Uh, even for someone like myself who doesn't actively margin trade, there's a market for it. And yeah. there needs to be players in this case who can actually provide a better experience. And I've kind of always pushed that for crypto, and no matter yeah. what exchange or you know, whether people are into decentralized exchanges or centralized. One thing I want to ask you about, Ben, to kind of talk about that topic is, I think, a question of transparency in this case. And a lot of people want to know, especially, obviously, they can we can see here we're in an office. There's real people here. You guys are growing. You're providing a great service. Um, how are you guys aiming to provide a good sense of transparency with the community, engaging with the community to you know, make sure they not only feel safe with you know using the exchange, but along with that, um, can keep up to date with what you guys are doing and kind of become a part of the community? Yeah, so I, I guess being transparent and just letting clients know what we're doing is the key. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the staff and even the owner myself, we need to get out. So mm -hmm. we need to meet the people face to face. 
So uh, I, I try to as much possible to uh, go into our Telegram, be on Twitter. So whenever uh, you file a complaint or whatever, I mean, I would apply personally on the Twitter or on the on, right. the, on the Telegram, mm -hmm. and that's very important to uh, to let your client know that they are actually fund the owners. And uh, we are also uh, one of the module of the company is listen, care, improve. So. Uh, we built uh, by a bit for the clients, so uh, mm -hmm. client feedback is extremely important to us. Uh, we're actually working on a dedicated feedback page uh, on Bybit where you can actually actually suggest any uh, feedback you have on the platform, and it will be publicly displayed uh, in a sort of a Q and A style. Okay. And then we will say if we took the advice or not, or why we are not taking it. And uh, once uh, the feedback is taken, we'll send you merchandise. So uh, oh. Bybit shirt, Bybit hat, and all that. So we're actually working on that redesign of that page. Mm. But previously, uh, we, we have always been, uh, whenever a new feature is coming out, we want to do a general consensus uh, questionnaire from the clients and get the feedbacks of uh, what, what, what they think about that. So uh, I, I guess just be completely transparent and also um, with our rules, uh, any updates to the system, we have a all the historical updates blog in our blog page so you can see that what we are doing and what we are making changes to our contract, right. uh, to our mark price, and all that details. Yeah, that's awesome. I mean, I think obviously being able to have the quick customer response time you had, I think it was around two minutes, if I'm correct, in that case to be able to get general response. Yeah, and also uh, I've seen a lot of startups do that. A lot of companies, including ourselves, we, um, the previous company I worked at, a startup in Silicon Valley, had that same mindset where you need to not only take customer feedback, provide customer support, but put those priorities in check and also show to the community as a whole, you know, that you're giving them a voice in this case and then directly engaging with them. I like the idea of giving them merchandise. Yeah, I think it's, yeah, it's a good yeah. way to engage. No, we, we, we actually tell the community, uh, you can give us feedback and here's your feedback mm -hmm. on the homepage. You can see it, it's been logged in and then uh, what's our response to that? So that's how, I guess, not only to say the word transparent, you actually act and show it to the people. Mm -hmm. So that's how I'm doing it. Yeah. That's awesome. But it, one thing I want to get, I guess we, we've talked a good amount about Bybit and everything. I mean, you've obviously been in traditional Forex markets. Yeah. And I always like to get a perspective on, on just kind of a personal note. Yeah. You know, going from this market to crypto, what are you looking forward to in 2020, 2021? Uh, I, I know I've got a lot of exciting visions for where this space can go as a new emerging asset class, but I'd like to get some of your perspective as you also have a little bit of a traditional background. Yeah, I, I think um, mm -hmm. a lot of people think, I think the number one issue or the problem we all need to tackle is mass adoption. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people focus on the future part, on the other part of the spectrum where can we design a technology to for the existing firms to 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 use to drive the mass adoption. Mm -hmm. So I think we can work also backwards as, as Bybit. What we can do is um, we're actually looking into connect Bybit into traditional tools such as MT4, MT5. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I think a lot of the Forex traders and uh, traditional traders are very used to the tools they're using. Mm -hmm. One of the major issues I had uh, before finding Bybit and in crypto is that I, I, I simply don't know how to use all these web pages to trade. Right. I'm very used to this terminal. Actually, you have a terminal on your desktop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, you can use uh, uh, Ninja Traders or Metacode mm -hmm. and all these good stuff, but it, has, it hasn't been implemented into crypto. And I believe that whole sector of clients and in the traditional space, they are not moving in because simply the tool is not being provided to them. Yes. So what we, we are looking for is we're actually actively talking to medical to see if we can connect Bybit uh, into MT5 or MT4 so that we can actually offer that sector of new clients to say, hey, uh, crypto is ready. Uh, yeah. It's actually we have really good liquidity because when I, whenever I talk to my friends in Forex, they just say, well, it's really bad liquidity. I don't want to trade. Yeah. Huge slippage and all that. But no, actually the space has been evolved so much and the liquidity has gotten so much better. But they don't know about it because they, they don't check the web page. They look at it, they find it. Uh, they see it as a foreign system. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But that kind of way, you yeah. just can actually start to integrate it with the traditional world. Yeah, so so yeah. that's the, that's the plan we're, we're heading to, I think, after the ex satisfying the existing client pool, we're moving to a new direction, but we're moving backwards to the traditional guys and mm -hmm. to say, hey, we have fixed API, we have this, all these things, you can check us out. You know. That's awesome. And I, like I said, coming from a background where I've done traditional equities, investing commodities, and also done a little bit of Forex as well, yeah. um, I gotta say, if you can actually bridge that gap, I don't know when you guys are planning to do that or if, if it's 100% confirmed, yeah. that would be huge. Yeah. It would not only bring more liquidity into yeah. the space, yeah. I think for cryptocurrencies for better price discovery, 
but it's going to be able to showcase like, you know, this is a maturing sector, let's plug it into your traditional tools you're used to, yeah. traditional terminals. Yeah. Man, I think this is really exciting stuff. Yeah. So I'm glad you guys have this kind of forward thinking narrative. If people want to kind of learn a little bit more, you know, maybe someone might be a little bit skeptical or maybe just want to learn a little bit more about how to actually get involved in trading, maybe it's their first time, how would they get involved with Bybit, maybe learn a little bit more? Um, I mean, simply check out our homepage. Mm -hmm. um, also, we are working on a new education program. Oh. Uh, so we're actually talking to a lot of the uh, educators in the space. So mm -hmm. we were talking to Tom Bays, uh, we're talking to Jacob Canfield for providing a sort of online top type of webinar or written content. Because what we, I'm also this is what I'm not used to is that for first trader you have Bibi Pips and all these right. websites that's extremely useful, very systematic to learn TA to learn risk management and all that. And uh, but I find in crypto uh, because the the, the, the the trading pair is so different from right. actual contract, but no one is doing a really systematic. Uh, trading uh, system to teach yeah. them. So this is what we want to focus on, uh, I guess, in the uh, next quarter. And soon uh, we will have a few good speakers to give our clients a weekly webinar to teach them about uh, how to do trading and how to use the system. I like yeah. that, Ben, because the one thing I think, especially if the, in Forex, it's normal to use kind of like double digit margin levels and stuff and kind of have that within a, a reasonable risk reward profile. But I think in crypto where it's so volatile, it's good to know how to have proper risk management. Use uh, margin if you're going to in a proper way, yeah. with your, according to your risk in that case and what your time frame is. So I think having you know some of the people in the space who I trust for trading and people I listen to, I think it's going to be awesome to actually yeah. have that for by bit. But yeah. man, I gotta say, it's been a pleasure talking with you, man. It's cool to be out here in Singapore. I'm excited for our panel. And yeah. again, I, I wish you guys all the best. If you continue down this track record and stuff of you know providing a better experience than some of the other players, I think it's very imperative for the space. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Awesome. Well, guys, if you want to find a little bit more information on what Ben and the rest of the team are doing at Bybit, we'll leave some links down below in the description so you guys can get engaged and learn more. Uh, but again, it's a very exciting, uh, changing time here in the crypto space. So we'll hopefully have Ben back on the channel sometime in the future. That being said, everyone, thank you for tuning in and we'll see you on the next video.